this video, we're going to be talking about physical member modeling. To help illustrate this, we have a simple truss model here that's been drawn in the PowerPoint. And this could be actually modeled in a number of different ways, some of which may employ the concept of physical member modeling. Now, for a bit of background here, there's essentially two options. We have analytical or physical members. You may not be familiar with the two, but more than likely you've used analytical members in the past. Analytical members only have two joints, a joint at the start of the member and a joint at the end. And this is actually what SRAM Solver uses. It doesn't care if they're as a continuous member or not, it just sees analytical members. Now, a physical member, on the other hand, can have multiple joints along its length without being broken up into smaller segments. And this is done for the user, not for the solver. And it may be done in the situation for design purposes, especially where you want to define unsupported lengths that span more than two joints. For instance, if you're doing a steel design or a concrete design. So in this first example here, we, if I just switch slides, we're looking here at an example that's only using analytical members. This means that the members only span between their start and end joints. At every intersection between two members, we have a joint. And in this situation here, our top and bottom cords aren't continuous. And this is likely not how we'd want to actually model this particular structure, at least not how it's going to be built. Now, if we look at the next slide, or sorry, I should mention, this is a representation of the analytical model, and this is, this is what SRAM Solver sees. On the next slide here, we have uh, a di different situation using the exact same geometry, but we've now defined the top and bottom cords as physical members, so that they span the entire length of the top and bottom cords, even though they have multiple joints along their length. So this means that the joints from the web members aren't breaking up the adjacent physical member. And this may actually be a more realistic portrayal of the truss as it would be actually, actually constructed. And we can play around with it as well. So here we have an example where we could use smaller physical members to represent the top and bottom cords. And this may be done in the event that the spans of between supports aren't identical along the length of the member. And since you can only define one unsupported length per member, you may want to divide the member up into smaller components to accurately represent the span length during steel design. So we'll look at an example of this within SRAM. We're actually going to build a model from scratch. So I have a new 3D model here. And I'm going to define a one meter spacing grid to help me lay out this model. I also want to make sure that I'm using the physical member option, uh, which has to be enabled within SRAM. So I'm going to go to settings, preferences. And within the settings preferences dialog here, we have this option where we can turn on model using physical members. And this just allows us to enable this setting within the model. So I press OK. And if you're very observant, you may have noticed that this button at the bottom of the screen here, which says build model using physical members, this is a toggle that we can toggle on or off depending on whether or not we want it. And I'm gonna to toggle this on. So now any members that I draw are gonna be physical members. So when we're doing this, we generally input the primary elements first, if those are gonna be physical members. So I'm gonna start off by laying out the geometry using the member definition tool. I'm going to use the one joint method, and I'm going to start by defining the members in the x direction, the length of eight meters. So I'll go with one eight meter member right here, and another one just a little bit further down, nine meters away. And I'm going to connect these members now. So this will be connected by nine meter members. And if we look here, I'm just going to do create a member at the mid span to connect as well, halfway in between, so I'll say at midpoint, and again at the midpoint, it's just gonna ask me when I click that joint here, if it wanted to find that member connecting at the midpoint of the adjacent member.
You may notice here that I've got this option toggled on to shrink the elements for visual checks. This is shrinking the members from their from their ends, basically. And you'll notice here that it's shrunk them from each end, but in this situation for the eight meter long beams, it hasn't shrunk them from this interior node. That's because it's a physical member that can have multiple nodes along its length without being broken up into individual members. I can also display the member numbers, and I can see that I don't have two members along these eight meter long beams, which is what I wanted to do. So that's the way I want it to work. Now we're gonna draw in a couple of choice here as well, and I'm gonna do that using the Generate Infill Beams tool. If I left click on this tool, I can generate the choice in a specific direction. So here I'm just gonna say, generate the choice within the short direction. And I'm gonna generate two beams with equal spacing. I'm just gonna left click within each span to generate these joists. And if I look a little closer here, I can see that by default, those joists that I added were released automatically for me. I could always adjust that if I wanted to, but I'm not gonna worry about it. Now we can always choose to release the other members if you want, and actually I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna left click on this member here. Oh, sorry, I actually was using the wrong tool. So I'm gonna switch to the release tool. And I can define releases on the other members as well. If I wanted to do that, I can just left click on the member end that I want to apply it to, like this, and you can see the releases. Notice that I'm seeing this double arrowhead to represent the releases. I could also go to the options menu and then toggle off this releases option. And then I'll just see a little crescent moon shape, whatever we prefer. I prefer the double arrowhead so I can see the directions that it's released in. I'm gonna actually just left click and apply the releases to every single member in this model. We also need to find some sections. So I'm gonna to go to the section properties tool, which is currently empty. I'll turn off the display of my releases. I'm gonna right click on this and add a couple steel sections. So I'll left click on the steel button and I'm gonna add two sections to my model. They're gonna be I sections or I beam sections. And one of them I'm gonna look for here is a W530 by 82 section. So I'm just gonna left click on this guy. I can see the section properties and I can click add to. And I'm also gonna add a W310 by 39 section. So I just select it from the list and click add to as well. And then press okay. I'll just give each one a unique color. So blue for the larger section, red for the smaller section. Click close. And you'll notice here that we have this drop down list in the section tool that shows us the active section. Currently it's a W310 by 39. And by default it's assigned section number one to every member. But if I want to assign the smaller section to my choice, I just gotta make sure it's the active section, either by clicking it from this drop down list or just selecting the colored box next to its name within this legend. And if you don't see this legend, just toggle on or off this display legends button at the bottom of the screen. It's a rainbow colored button and you'll be able to see it. And I just need to left click on the members I wish to change a section to and I'll be able to adjust it there. We can also generate folders uh, representing the different section assignments. When we're using the section tool, I can just click on generate folders and it's going to generate an attributes based folder for my sections and it's going to categorize this based on which members have which section. So I have five members with this W530 by 82 section and four members with the W310 by 39 section. So it's just easier for me to select a small group of those. I don't need to worry about my steel materials. Uh, since those are already assigned for me. Uh, so I don't need to adjust that, but for my supports, I'm gonna look at applying some supports, uh, fully fixed supports to the four corners. So making sure all six degrees of freedom are checked here and just left click on the four corner joints to apply. We also need to look at how we wanna load this. And I'm gonna apply some area loads and we need to use panels to model these area loads. Now, 
We've talked about area loads and panels within the previous G101 training course, uh, but just so you know, area load panels just provide a surface for the loading. It doesn't actually add the load itself. But I'm going to define a panel here by using the panel element tool. And I'm just going to select the area load panel, area load only panel rather, and just left click and draw this. I'd like to draw counterclockwise. I recommend you always choose a consistent direction because it defines the direction of the local coordinate system. So I've now created this area load panel. It hasn't created the load yet. I still need to do about to do more about that. I need to think about which members are going to support this area load, type of span we have as well. So for the members that we want to support the area loads, we can go to the area load members folder. And we can see that right now it's actually got all the members in this folder. I'm just going to make sure it's got that uh, all selected. So I'm going to say, make sure every member in my model is going to support these area loads by selecting them within this little folder here and going update open group. So it just tells S-Frame which members can support area loads, which ones can't. You may have braces that you don't want to support the area loads. That's perfectly fine. It's up to you, but you have the option to control that. And now once we've done all that, we can then use the span direction tool. And we can tell S-Frame how we'd like the tributary areas for each one of these area load members to be assigned. So I have a two-way option here in the data bar. I can left click on the panel handle at the middle of this panel. And you can see that it's drawn for me the tributary areas based on the two-way span direction. I'm just going to unshrink the elements so it's a little bit easier to see as well. I also have a short waistband, one way span, it's spanning along the short direction of each span, and a long one way span, and we can use whichever one we want. I'm going to go with the short one way span direction. Then we're going to move along to the loads menu after we've defined all this. And again, I'm going to shrink the elements or unshrink the elements for visual checks. We're going to create a couple different load cases three in total. So I'm just going to click new low case and go to self weight first. And I'm going to define a gravitational factor in the Z direction of negative one. That's for my self weight, which is now taken care of. I also want to create two more. I'll do one that is slab dead and I'm not going to have a gravitational factor. And another one that is slab live. And again, I'm not going to have gravitational factor in either of those because I already have that assigned in my self-weight low case and I don't want to overestimate how much self-weight is in my model. Now for these last two low cases, slab dead and slab live, I don't have the self-weight loads so I have to apply my own loads using the tools within that string. And we can use the area load tool for this. So I can go to the area load tool, left click on this, and I can specify the magnitude. I'm going to go with a negative 3 kPa, or kilonewtons per meter squared. The orientation, so global Z. You can see the orientation of the Z axis here. And all I need to do then is left click on the panel handle to apply it. And it's applying that to the whole area. It's going to break down those area loads into member loads based on the tributary areas. I'm going to switch again to slab live. And just so you get an idea for how this works, I'll do this one slightly differently. I'm going to go with a magnitude of negative 5 kilonewtons per meter squared. And I'm also going to say convert the area loads to member loads on the fly. This is what the solver is doing for us automatically behind the scenes, but we're going to do this on the fly. And I'm going to just turn on the display of my member loads so we can see what happens. I'll just go left click and apply. And you can see it's broken that down into its uh, representative member loads based on these area load that I applied of negative 5 kPa and the associated member load or area load span directions. At this stage, the only thing we have left to do is to find some load combinations. So I'll go to edit, load combinations, and I'm going to do one here, 1.25 dead plus 1.5 live, and another one below that, 1.0 dead plus 1.0 live. I'll just scroll over to the side here 
and define those however I need them to be. So 1.25 and 1, I'm defining 2 at the same time, that's why you see me selecting two rows. 1.25 for the first little combination and 1.0 for the second one. And the same thing for the live, 1.5 and 1. And if we had this in a spreadsheet, we could import that as well. There are also ways of defining low combinations based off of the MBCC building code uh, requirements. So that's another option you have. It's available within the help system if you're interested. Now, the last step I want to do is save my model before I run the analysis. So I'm just going to go run or file, save as. Let me just save this somewhere where I can refer back to it. And I'm going to go to the run menu after I saved it and go to an analysis. Now, before we run our analysis, which I'm going to do for both load cases and combinations, I would always recommend that you check your model for common integrity issues using this check model button here. This will allow you to check the model for common issues that might cause issues with your analysis that are easier to spot at this stage than after you run the analysis. Things like stray nodes, duplicate members, overlapping members, those sorts of things. And you can check based off of these user specified tolerances. I'm just going to click the search button. And luckily for me, there were no issues, but this is a, always a good recommendation uh, when you're starting to analyze a model to just run an integrity check first. It can save you a lot of time if you don't do it and you run into issues later on. So now we're gonna click OK to run the analysis. Here's a solution trail, and you can see that we ran an analysis for both low cases and combinations. So we have all three low cases and both low combinations, and we didn't have any issues. And now we can look at some of the results. So we want to see what's perhaps reasonable uh, here. We might want to look at the deflections. And if I turn off the display of my member loads here, I can look at the low combination deflections, the def factor deflections, and I can see the amount of deflection we get at a specific joint by talking on DZ, displacement in Z. So I want to make sure that the deflected shape looks reasonable, the members are all connected and so on. I can look at moment diagrams, I'll toggle on the display of my legend, and we can see here that it's breaking it up into stations. We have five stations by default, but we can actually increase that. And if I just right click on this member and go to properties, this is one of my continuous members, uh, physical member, we can see that it is continuous. We're not having it break up at the point that it intersects another member. So that's another advantage of using physical members, is you can get nice diagrams for the entire length of the member. And lastly, I'm just going to look at the reactions. So here I can look at the reaction diagrams and see the reactions at each joint location. This would help me if I'm looking at designing foundations that might be supporting this, for example. And you can see what those look like. And one last thing I wanted to mention about the moment diagrams or any really member diagram of any sort, is that we can look at those on a group by group basis as well. So remember we have these attribute groups for our sections. We can look at the moments within our larger sections and within our smaller sections and see what those equate to. And remember each member was released. So that's why we have them, uh, the moments going to zero at this point. You can see it's peaking at around 68 kilonewton meters.